Uh, I, I also received uh, an update from the school in Nigeria, and we have a little video here that I want to show you. Now remember, they don't have a Hollywood in Nigeria. So this is off of a cell phone, okay? And so I'd like you to just, uh, par part of the offerings that come into this church have for years gone there. And where you're seeing now building was nothing but jungle when I went there. And now here is the school and the children that are there. I'd like to remind you that the government of Nigeria, the federal government, is, is Muslim. And the reason the school was built was because they were saying that Christianity could not be taught in the schools. And they were introducing uh, the Islamic uh, religion to the Christian children. And so this Pastor Andrew, who came here and visited with us, said that the Lord had laid it on his heart to provide a place where families could put their children where they wouldn't be indoctrinated with Islam. Very much the same reason that now we have a school here. So watch and see what they have done with the money that you've sent. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. He has made me glad. He has made me glad. I am so glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. Child, at ease. Attention. The school anthem. This school played. Children, children, children. Oh, yeah. Children, Jesus loves you. Oh, yeah. Children. Yeah. Children, children, Jesus loves you. Children, 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 Jesus loves Children, children, children. Now it would not be fitting for us to just send to them and us not to receive from something from them. And you all, the Bible says that we are the children of God. I'd like you to notice that he does a call out and they respond. Are you ready? Children, 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 yes, Jesus loves you. Oh, yeah, Jesus loves you. Jesus loves you. Children, 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 Jesus loves you. Jesus loves you. Jesus loves you. Jesus loves you. Now, we receive and we give, amen. When you look at the buildings that are there, you see that one of them already has some windows in it. That's unheard of in Nigeria. Um, they leave the windows off because you don't usually need them. And the other building, he, he sent this to me last night, and he said that um, they've received windows for that second building. So if you consider when he first came to meet us, there was nothing but jungle there. And now uh, that is what has been built. And your offerings pay the salaries of all of the teachers as well as building the building because money goes a long way in Nigeria. Okay? All right, and we have another. Um, the Lord has brought uh, Marie and Nolan here some time back, and they minister in Juarez all through the week. And they had asked us if we wanted to participate at Christmas time in sending Christmas gifts to the pastor's family in Juarez. And so they've got some pictures that they're going to show us. Thank you. So um, our guests from LifeGate have to leave um, a little before 12, and so 
I'm going to invite you to come up now, and, and we can do, uh, we'll do some more stuff later, but um, they uh, were sharing at the pastor's meeting, and when I heard what they had to share and felt like this would was a gift from God for you, that God has some things that he wants to say to us as a church, I invited Judy to come and uh, share it here. And she said, when? And I said, Sunday. And so here she is. <laughs> Um, will she be comfortable with the microphone? Yes. Okay, good. If you'll introduce her. Go ahead and introduce her. Okay. Um, this is Marlene Salazar, and she is from Venezuela. And uh, your pastor asked me to. Uh, very, very, very happy to be here. Delights my heart to always get to be with other parts of the body of Christ and uh, see what all is going on. It's amazing. So thank you for the opportunity. Um, Marlene, I'm going to tell you, your pastor asked me to tell you how we met. So I'm going to tell you that real quickly, and then I want her to get into her story. I may ask her some questions along the way to prompt her to things that she might have forgotten, because I know quite a bit of details of her story. Um, but uh, we have a small team, most, well, we're all here, actually, those that are on this team that goes out. Um, we've been more sporadic lately, but we usually go out on Friday nights uh, late out into the streets to minister to anyone that actually needs the love of the Lord. We started out with just prostitutes. We've uh, totally extended to whoever's there. And uh, many times it's actually the pimps and others that are out there. But um, in the process, uh, on a Friday night, we were um, we had been ministering, just riding around looking for anyone who needed help uh, about 1230 at night. And, uh, and uh, Blanquita, who's here. Um, you know, I'm just going to call their names. I know we're short on time, but I just want to because they came and I want them, I want them to, to know how important it is to us that they're here and supporting us. They wanted to come just to get to be here. So Griselda, stand up. Just stand up and let them see your face. Blanquita, Jean, Jean, Jean keeps David going, but she has a hard time going herself sometimes. So. <laughs> So we will just have to greet her later on. But anyway, so Blanca and, and uh, Griselda and I were on the street, right? Or Noah's maybe Griselda wasn't because Griselda was, uh, I think, out of town. And then we had another member with us, uh, Nellie. We were on the streets. And so Blanquita says, are you ready to go home? And I said, you know what? Let's just go down the street. We're on Dyer. So let's just go down to this hotel. There's a hotel there that we had actually ministered to prostitutes in. We we uh, we work with trafficked victims sometimes, and we had actually been able to rescue a couple of girls different times from there. So we knew that there was all kinds of stuff that go on there. So when they when they started putting uh, migrants there, we decided that we would just, we knew we couldn't have contact with them, but we would just pray around. So we, we, we drive into the parking lot, we pray around the parking lot, we come, we do a couple of circles over what Lord says, and we just pray, and, and then we leave. And so that's, I said, you know what, let's just go down there. I feel like we should just go pray. So we went, and we saw um, children. Up on the back, it's a two-story, so I'm up on, the, up on the balcony, and we're like, uh-oh, because if that late at night, we know that there's trafficking there, and we were like, this is not a good thing. So we circled again and came back, and this time they had come down, and they were down in the parking lot. So we called them over to the car, and Blanquita says, you guys, you know, where's your mom and dad? And they pointed, and they said, well, she said, you need to go back into your room. And about that time, we saw people coming out of rooms, and it was actually the parents of these children, and Marlene and her son, Matias, were some of those people, and there were uh, several couples there. Uh, well, actually, there was only one couple, but um, there were others that were there with children. And but we began to just they they circled, and they had they had actually found out they had just gotten there from immigration, where immigration had processed them, and they had placed them in that hotel, um, awaiting the time that they were be flown away. They would have to to another city. But so we in the but my heart was immediately drawn, and I'm going to tell you this. I had a bad attitude <laughs> about migrants because, I mean, I was mixed. You know, I mean, I love, I was missionary. We were missionaries in Mexico for eight years deep in Mexico. I, and my two, I have two children that are adopted from Mexico. I love, I love migrants, but I didn't love the way things were going on. And, you know, all the stories, you don't know what to believe. And so I just, but I, when we, when we, when they showed up, I knew this was a God appointment. I knew it was. And uh, my heart immediately, all I wanted to do was help them because they never ask us for anything. The first thing that came out of their mouths was, do you know where we can get work? That's all they asked. And I said, can I, can I, uh, can, are you hungry? And they said, yes. And I said, okay. So we went and bought 
food at Whataburger. We own Whataburger just about <laughs> because that's what's late, open that late. So we constantly we bought those, brought back. And I, I offered to, I said, let me wash your clothes. Let me, I'll, I'll, I'll wash your clothes and, and I'll bring them back tomorrow. I promise. And they said, we don't have any other clothes. This is all we have. This is, this is, they take, they took everything else. So they take all of their clothes. Now, I don't know if the process is the same now. This was back in August, right? August, I think, September. They took their clothes. They take everything. I mean, everything, all of their clothes. They leave them with nothing. And uh, and, uh, everything that they have with them, they take. And they give them what they want them to have, one suit of clothes. And they'll, and they'll, but with Marlene, they put uh, uh, a bracelet on her leg as if she was a prisoner. And uh, she asked them, why are you doing that? And they said, because, uh, they said, we would give this to everyone, but we don't have enough. But it's a tracking device. But later on, uh, we found out, we knew that, that this was a God thing. But Marlene said, by her testimony, she said that that night she had been, she had her little boy, Matthias, who at that point was only five, very small, and they all looked very hungry. And uh, she said that she had, when they got to the hotel, she didn't stay in the room because she didn't want her son to see her cry because they were so hungry. And he was crying and asking his mommy for food, and she couldn't give him food, and she didn't want to go out and beg. So she said they were walking on the street. They walked up that street, that horrible street, that time of night. And walk and crying, and she said she asked God, God, please, give us some food. We don't want to beg. I don't want to beg, but, my, but we're hungry. And when she walked back to the hotel, and she said it wasn't 30 minutes later that we came, and we fed them. And so that's how we were connected, and uh, we got to know each other. And I'm going to let her pick it up from there, because I want her to tell you uh, a little bit of what it was like to get here, so that we understand more of their story. And then, and then what happened after she got here? Entonces, les dije que vas a empezar a decirles cuando llegaste, porque de la decisión y todo eso. Buenas tardes. Mi nombre es Marley. Este, vengo de Venezuela y la decisión la tomé porque, primeramente, en Venezuela una situación económica está muy difícil. Este, el sueldo cuando me vine eran de cinco dólares mensuales. Okay. She's, she just let you know that she's from Venezuela. Her name is Marín. And uh, that she came from Venezuela and she made the decision to come from Venezuela because at the time that she left Venezuela, the, the monthly salary, uh, the minimum was five dollars a month. Y entonces tengo un niño de seis años y eso me animó a venirme hasta acá porque había días que no tenían para darles que comer. She came because she has she had a little boy at that time. She he was five. He's, he's six now. And uh, he had. She said there they didn't have food. She didn't have a way to get food. And there there were days that they that she didn't have anything to feed him. And so that's what caused her to want to come here because that they understood that there would be food here. Este. Tuve que pasar siete países para llegar hasta acá. She had to pass through seven countries to get here. Tuve que atravesar una selva que nunca pensé que era tan peligrosa. De haberlo sabido nunca me hubiese atrevido. Y Malin, este, ¿cuándo viniste? ¿Viniste a pie o cómo viniste? ¿Y cómo llegaste a venir? O sea, por siete países, ¿cómo pasaste esos siete países? En cada país me tenía que parar a trabajar y para poder continuar. Para poder pa pagar. Okay, because we're told that, well, they, you know, give them transportation, they bring them. That's what I, I just heard someone say, that when they get to a different country, they put them on a bus, they take them to the border, and then they tell them they can't stay there. They burst. But for her, when and those that we, we talked to, um, she had to, every little bit along the way, she had to stop and find some kind of work because they had to pay for every kind of, anything, any kind of, they were, they, and they would walk, they would ride buses, they would ride tops of trains. And uh, she came to the, there's a, I forget what country it's in, but it's the jungle. And uh, that's where it's the most dangerous. And that's what she wants to tell you a little bit about. Okay. Okay. Along the way, they call this the selva, the, the, where they go, it's, it's actually, it's like the, it's, the, it's, I don't know what you would call it. <laughs> anyway, it's like the jungle, but it's, it, um, they, it takes, it, I forget how many days it takes them to get through. They have to pay the cartel before they go in. If they don't have enough to pay the cartel, they get a bracelet. It means that the cartel owns them until they pay it. 
um, while she's in there, she said that there's there all along the way there's dead people. The, her son saw more than one dead person, uh, a cadaver there, uh, rotting. They saw they saw a baby in a plastic bag with its head out, skeleton. They saw children floating in the river. They had to pass go over the river several times, many times, and it was it was many times too deep. At one point, it was so deep that she had to take everything that she owned. She had a little little camper like little um, tent thing that they like a lean-to thing that they would sleep under at night. She had, all of every all of it was taken by the river because it was so deep that she had to put little Matias on her shoulders. She couldn't carry anything else. And uh, death, that mountain is actually called the mountain of death. There's so many people that die. Pasé tres días metida en esa selva y ya el casi el último río porque pasamos el río como 300 veces porque casi toda la selva es río. Este, en un río, el, el uno de los más peligrosos por poco se lleva a mi niño y sol, ahí tuve que soltar mis bolsos, todas mis pertenencias, me quedé sin carpa y logré salir de allí con mi niño. She's telling about when the, 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 they were there. It took them three days walking to get through there. And at the third day, this is when they came to the most dangerous part of the river, and that's when she almost lost her son. And so, as a result, she lost everything else that she had. Uh, but for them, it it's traumatic. And and uh, it, okay. Luego que salí de allí, llegué a México. El mismo día que llegué, me entregué a migración, pero antes de entregarme, este, casi todas las personas que venían, bueno, todas las personas, la única que me quedé fui yo que me salvé de que no me secuestraran y yo y el niño porque estábamos de lado abajo los que secuestraron venían de por las partes de arriba por la orilla de las carreteras y todos los secuestraron en mi presencia. Okay, there was a, a part of the road that they were they were in Mexico they're here in Juarez on the frontera and they were walking up on the road and they had told them don't when you don't when you get to the certain part of the road you have to get down off the road and just walk below it because there's there's um they they're constantly uh, kidnapping people and so she did she got down and she said they had barely gotten down off the road and there was a lot of families people that they were with and two black SUVs drove up with with machine guns gathered them all up they were screaming and put them in the SUVs and drove off she, the only reason that she didn't get to go have to, to go or be kidnapped was because she was hiding below on the where they had told her to go I'm going to interrupt just like your husband did right here okay Many of the bodies that they saw were mutilated. It was obvious that they were harvesting their organs. And so they are, as they're traveling here, either they are being taken and sold into prostitution, or many of them, their organs are being harvested. And then, of course, children, you saw uh, Sound of Freedom, so you know what's going on there. There is This is the epitome of evil. Okay, thank you. They come because, and not, not everybody, she... Marlene herself has told me, she said, Pastor, you have to be careful because there are, she said, I'm ashamed of my country because so many people that are coming are only coming for what they can get or they're coming because they're bad. But there's a lot that aren't coming because of that. They're coming because they don't have any hope um, and they're they're looking for it. And they're told that when they get here, there'll, there'll be work, that they'll be, uh, they'll have, they can find a place to live. They'll all, they'll be able to get what they need. They're not expecting handouts. The first thing they asked me was for work. All they want to do is have the opportunity because in their country they're starving to death. The children, the schools, the teachers are not are quitting the schools because they can't stand it. The children are so they're emaciated. They look like corpses in class because they're so hungry. Okay. No, it's just not. Now she's going to tell you a little bit of her story. Whatever she feels the freedom to tell you and, and uh, is able to tell you about what's happened to her since she's been here. Allí pasé cinco días en migración retenida con el niño. Allí me soltaron y me mandaron acá a una oficina con muchos más emigrantes a esperar a que un familiar o un patrocinador que tengamos acá nos pudiera pagar el vuelo. Okay, they, the, she was with immigration for five, she was at the hotel for five days and they're, they're told that they have to come up with a certain amount of money to pay, to pay for their for their flight, and then she was going to Chicago because her husband, who was murdered in Venezuela, had a, a, a conocido, a 
uh, I don't know what how that is in English. Uh, uh, yeah, I'm a friend up in Chicago, and that's where because they have to tell them where they want to go, and they they have to go to one of the uh, most of the time they have to go to one of the uh, sanctuary cities, and so she told them Chicago. So, but in the meantime, she's there for five days, but and uh, she still has to come up with the money. She has to figure out a way to get the money. Okay. Mientras esperaba en esa oficina, se hizo de noche y de esa oficina nos mandaron a un hotel. En ese hotel, todos los compañeros que estaban allí este, se pusieron de acuerdo para irse a pedir comidas a un McDonald's que estaba cerca. Y yo llegué con mi niño y el niño mío tenía mucha fiebre, estaba venía enfermo por todo lo que habíamos pasado. Y el niño estaba, estaba en el McDonald's y el niño me dijo, no aguanto más. Vámonos que me siento muy mal. Y allí me regresé con mi niño llorando, pidiéndole a Dios que no diera comida. Y en ese momento conocí a la pastora. Que okay, she's just giving you her version of the oh, what she's what I shared with you about how her child was so hungry um, after, after they shipped into the hotel and, and, and how she was asking the Lord for food and how that's when when she saw us. Okay, cuando conozco a la pastora la pastora no la pastora con Blanca estaba en el carro y ahí conoció a mi niño y allí platicamos y ella nos ofreció comida y nos compró comida ese día ya después más adelante la pastora terminó comprándome el vuelo a Chicago y ya después que ella me compra el vuelo a Chicago me voy a Chicago porque me quería quitar el grillete, que eso me impedía muchas cosas. Ok, they had put this thing on her leg and they told her that she, the only way she could get that off was that she had to show up in Chicago. And so, because in my heart I knew that she didn't need to go to Chicago. We were praying about that and I thought, no, she's, there's something going to happen. We need to keep her here. But they told her, you cannot, you have to go to Chicago to get this off your leg. And so she said that's what, what that was her. And so we, we helped her with the, the, the flight and she got on the flight. Cuando llego a Chicago, este, conocí un señor en el aeropuerto que le dio dulce a mi niño y me ofreció trabajo para él. Él trabajaba, me dijo que trabajaba haciendo comida, comida rápida, y me ofreció trabajo. Y de allí yo no, yo me fui a casa de los amigos. De allí en casa de los amigos... El dueño llegó, el dueño del apartamento y dijo que solo el contrato eran de cuatro personas, no aceptaba más. Mis amigos me llevaron a una estación de policía que había muchísimos inmigrantes allí. Okay, so she got to Chicago when she got, and listen to this, when she got off the plane, because this is what traffickers do. There was a man there, she was waiting, the people weren't there to receive her right away, and a man came up to her and gave, him, gave her his information and said, um, I, I can get you work, I, I have a lot of uh, uh, people that we provide food for, and that work, uh, workers, and you can help cook. Um, so here's my information. Uh, if you want work, call me. I and, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. And so they came and got her. They took her to the apartment. A few days later, they told her she could not stay there any longer because the manager said, you, you're, you have too many people in the apartment. So they kicked them out. And they ended up in a police station that had been converted in where it was solid that all the immigrants that were there were sleeping on the floor uh, wall to wall because it's cold in Chicago. Ahí en la estación de policía había muchísimos inmigrantes cuando llegaba la comida. Allí se caían hasta puñaladas por la comida. Y eso me, me puse a revisar mi teléfono, a pensar, a pensar qué iba a hacer allí. Porque con el grillete se me hacía difícil conseguir un trabajo y con el niño todo eso. I want you to understand that she ended up in the same, almost the same situation she was in in Venezuela. Because there, there were so many people, they would get there, would bring food, but she said it was like animals, they would just attack. So she would stick, stay back with her son, and if there was food left over, she would get it. But they were hungry again. He was hungry again, and she did not know what she was going to do. And so she, she, she was looking, trying to figure out something to do. And what she wants you to understand is the decision that she made to call this man was out of desperation. She did not feel like she had any other choice. Allí llamé al señor ese que había conocido en el aeropuerto y le dije que necesitaba trabajar, que sí podía trabajar con él. Y le insistí muchísimo, muchísimo que él me fue a buscar un día domingo. Y, y ese día domingo me fue a buscar como a las 3 de la tarde. Y era a las 7 de la noche y todavía no habíamos llegado a donde él me iba a llevar a trabajar. 
I was keeping in touch with her, but at this point, we had lost. I had uh, I I had begun to have. Uh, I wasn't. She wasn't con contacting me as much, mostly because of uh, the situation that she was in was so desperate. But um, so this guy shows up. She calls this guy. She remembers this piece of paper. She's got this. She calls him. He comes and gets her. Um, and at three o'clock in the afternoon, and by seven o'clock that night, they still had not gotten where they were going because they transported her to Michigan. So when they got to the house that they were taking her to, which was really late, she had no idea. She kept. She was already crying. She said, where are you taking us? What are you going to do? Please don't do anything to us. And when they got to the house, it was completely abandoned. There were cars all around that were abandoned, that were broken down or whatever. It was just a horrible looking place. And she said there were three men waiting outside for her. She said that she was crying because she knew that she shouldn't have made that decision, but it was too late. There was nothing she could do about it. So when she got into the house, she said the first thing she saw was a huge. Are you familiar with the Santa Muerte? It is. A, yeah, it's a cult. It's. It's run literally by the cartel. All of you don't realize that, but it, it. But there was a huge altar built to the Santa Muerte. The, the, the walls were full of dead people, full photos of dead people. Because they had transferred her across to another state. Judy, I'm sorry. Okay, parents. I should have said something ahead of time. I did not think about it. Um, she may share something here that that might be difficult for sensitive ears. So parents, if you want to take your children uh, into the back, you can. Okay. She's not going to go into detail, but it'll be. It could be yeah. something that you have to answer the question. I should have said that at the beginning. My apologies, folks. But she, um, the minute she got in there, because she had this identification. Uh, thing that on her leg that was that was that was a tracking device. Um, immigration immediately called because they had transferred her across state. She had no idea where she was, but they called. And uh, so in the minute that the phone rang, she didn't she doesn't speak English. So the guy, um, when the, when they saw first of all when they saw the thing on her leg, he was furious because they knew that she would be tracked. If they took it off, they knew that they would. Immigration would show up. They knew that that was so. He was furious. They were furious because this guy had brought her with that on her leg, which was God. She'd be dead otherwise. And so would Matthias or or trafficked. But because of that, then he was then he. But he took the phone from her. He said, "Let me, let me, let me." She, she, he said, "Who is that?" And she said, "Immigration." So he took it and he talked. He spoke to them in English, gave it back to her, and said, "It's going to be okay. You can stay here." So what happened after that was this guy that had picked her up. They didn't stay in that house. He took her to. He put her, her and Matias back in the car, and took her to a uh, uh, a place. Uh, she described it as a mountain. It was just a, a deserted place, uh, she, like a little trailer. And he took her in and he proceeded to uh, rape her and abuse her. And threatened her, told her she needed to learn something. She was going to learn some things. And this is typical trafficking uh, scenario. So then they put her. He put her back, took her, took her back to the house, and uh, did all this with her little boy there. But her little boy was sound asleep. God put him to sleep. I mean, it's just the God's hand of protection in the midst of this is amazing. So she's back at the house, and uh, then she knows that she has got something's got to happen. She did let me know things were going on. Actually, Griselda and Blaca and Nelly were at the house. It was on a Sunday, and we began to pray. I mean, I mean, we just I began to weep, and we began to pray and cry out to God to rescue her. But He needed somebody to help Him here on earth. He needed someone that would 
be his hands and feet here. Do you understand what I'm saying? If we not had that, if I continued with the same attitude I had and not allowed God to do what he did in my heart, this would not have taken place. But she, she ended up being rescued. Miss Eagle, come with um, let me, let me, because we are short on time, and because I, I know this. and I, So she, through a series of different events, um, we began to pray uh, uh, immediately. Uh, when, she, when I found out what was going on, I, she didn't even know. She knew what had happened to her, and she knew she needed to get out, but she had no idea. We knew what, pretty much what they had planted just because of the scenario. And so it took days. I began to call around. I called around here, the city, the people that I know of that work with traffickers, and, uh, and, and different situations, but the problem was that she was in Chicago. And uh, so, but I said, God, you, you have to help us with this. So she came to a place where she was desperate enough. They were supposed to take her into town to see a doctor. Her little boy was going to see him, and she was hoping that they were going to get to go. They were supposedly going to get him ready for school. And at the last minute, he said, I'm not taking you. Because he realized, he had told her, if you marry me, I'll get that off your leg. And they said, if you have my baby... You'll never be deported. But she said, nothing doing. And she told him the next time they tried anything, he said, she said, you will not touch me. And, you know, I, I think that God probably put a giant angel there with her. I don't know. But they backed off. And he, she didn't even see the guy that raped her again. She didn't, he, 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 she didn't see him. He disappeared <coughs> because, at, because of that thing on her leg. Because they knew that, that they couldn't just do what they wanted to do because someone would show up. Eventually what happened was, she was supposed to be taken to town, and she realized that they weren't going to do that because she was going to try to escape. That's where we were back and forth. I tried to get an Uber or a taxi or something just to go there. It was so deserted, no one would even go in that, to that area. But she would already tried to get out once. She got lost. She went back because she was so scared. But the guy left again, so she got out because she was keeping herself and her son locked in the bedroom as much as she could, even though there wasn't a lock. She would follow everything against the door. And he didn't bother her, but he left. He told her no one leaves. He told her no one leaves this house. So he was just biding his time. But he left. <coughs> Excuse me. And and um, so she gathered. She realized that they weren't going to town. She gathered up her son and her things, and she took off. She got lost again. Realized she was in the wrong direction. Came back and said, "God, please help me," because she had to go back by the house. Got finally up to the road, and she said cars were passing. She said finally one passed, just a truck, and she waved them down. And it was a guy, and she and she went on the next I heard from her, because we were praying. I didn't know this was going on, but she called me, and she said, can you please translate? So I began to talk to the guy, and uh, he was actually a taxi driver. <coughs> I told him what I needed. I needed him to get her into town, into a hotel safe, and he said, okay, I'll do it. He took her into town. Got, we got her into the hotel, and I said, okay, tell me what I owe you. And he said, I'm not going to let you pay me a thing. You can't pay me anything. I, got, I was able to get an Uber for the next day to take her into the town. They were little, these are little birds, to another town that actually had the bus station. He told me, I'll stay with her till she gets on the bus. I mean, these are just people that God instrumented. But the night that she was finally in the hotel, it was amazing to me. Just God, I, I just, just, God did it. You know, for her to get rescued from there was amazing. And, and then she got back to Chicago, and through a series of events, which was not easy, she got back here. And uh, when she got back here, my husband, Pastor Buster, he said, do not put her back on the street. You bring her to our house. And that's where she is now. I had an extra bedroom. Just got through renovating it. It was perfect for her. And she'll be there until we figure something else out. But life goes on for her. But, she's, but what I want you to understand is this. Had I not been able to be, I had my heart softened by the Lord. And uh, I asked the Lord today when we were coming, I said, God, what do you want me to say? And uh, he reminded me of the story, which I know you've probably heard, uh, of a little boy that was on a the beach. There was an old man walking on the beach. He saw a little boy, and the beach was covered with starfish that had washed up, and they were stranded. And the little boy was walking along. Every few minutes, he would pick one up and throw it back into the ocean. And he said, the old man, he came up to the old where the old man was, and the old man says, what are you doing? And he said, throwing these throwing these back, and he said, why? He said, look, there's a thousands of them. There's, you're not going to make much of a difference. You know, you're not going to make a difference. And he picked up a starfish, and he said, I'm going to make a difference to this one. And he threw it back. 
Judy, instead of a question and answer time, because I know how short, and thank you, so I know your, your, your child is over there waiting for you. Thank you so much. But two things. One, would you let us help you in whatever way we can with this ministry? Could we, I'll, I'll touch base with you later this week. And we'll we'll talk about how we might be able to help you. There may be someone that wants to to go with you. The other thing is, folks, what we were talking about, and Buster pointed this out, and Judy alluded to it. To it, we have these mountains of morality where one side is saying, "Well, we have to be a rule of law," and the other side is saying, "Well, we have to have compassion." And they stand and they debate and they raise all kinds of money in their election campaigns and stuff. And, and this group is between those two mountains, actually in the war, ministering to individual people. And Marlon is a believer. This is our sister in Christ who is here. Um, uh, Veronica ran up and gave you a Kleenex. Uh, I think everybody needs a Kleenex right now. So we're going to very quickly... Just minister to her, okay? And then I know you have to go, okay? But if you would like to sit down, you're welcome yeah. to. No, I just have a seat. Okay. And we're going to dry some tears right now. Okay. okay. What do you do when there's that type of darkness in the world? Levantos mis manos. Will you sing with me? Aunque no tenga fuerza. Levantos mis manos. Aunque tenga. Cuando levanto mis manos, comienzo a sentir una unción que me hace cantar. Cuando levanto mis manos, comienzo a sentir el fuego. Cuando levanto mis manos, mis cartas se van. Nuevas fuerzas tú me das. Todo esto es posible. Todo esto es posible. Cuando levanto mis manos. Cuando levanto mis manos. Mis carjas se van, nuevas fuerzas tú me das. Todo eso es, todo eso es. Cuando levanto mis te amo mucho, hermano, y bienvenidos aquí en el nombre de Jesús y siempre. Estás, estás en su casa también, siempre. Y Mateo, is it Ma Ma what's his name, the little boy's name? Matias, is already a powerful prayer warrior. Isn't that great? So you've spent so much time with us, and I'm sorry to have rushed you like that. I, I knew you were out of time, so anyway. God bless you, and I'll be in touch with you this week, okay? Gonna ask the worship team to come and we will worship God with our with our offerings. And as they're coming, go ahead and have a seat and tell me what did you hear today? And Deanna, next week we'll have you share. Are you gonna be here? Okay. What did you hear today, church? God is moving in power, okay. I'm sorry. We need compassion, yes. What else?
Don't believe everything people say because they could make you hate the immigrants. Yes. What else? Anything else? Mm. Ray's mother-in-law passed away a couple of years ago, and that was the song that she loved. Um, in Luke chapter 22, verse 27, Jesus says, For which, for who is greater, the one who reclines at the table or the one who serves? Is it not the one who reclines at the table, yet I am among you as one who serves? <clears throat> There's a lot of serving that needs to be done in our city these days. Amen. Let's just, uh, let's worship him with our offerings and then we'll dismiss. I was talking about this song with the worship team earlier. The border is a mess and human beings are uh, dying on their way here. And then when they get here, it's not the heaven that they thought it would be. And there's a lot of pain and anguish all along the border right now. And just at that time, the God Loves You Tour is going to be traveling from Brownsville all the way to California. And we were talking about when we did this song to think about it as just in the nick of time, God is coming to the border with a message of hope.